MCDP1 war fighting. All right, gents um, and gals, if you're listening. So all we're gonna do here is we're just gonna do an unscripted take um, of MCDP1, uh, which is essentially the very first doctrinal publication um, that the Marine Corps kind of put out for everyone to read. Um, so that we have a better clear-cut understanding of what exactly it is we're getting ourselves into and kind of like the job field that we hold. So we're going to go to chapter one first, which is the nature of war. Um, before we even start, we have to identify what war even is. As war fighters, if you don't know the type of enterprise, uh, the type of profession that you're in, the experiences that you're going to undertake um, in this institution, then um, I think this is the place that you need to turn to so you understand what exactly you're getting into. So, war defined. War is a violent clash of interests between or among organized groups characterized by the use of military force. Super simple, lamest terms, not to insult those intelligence. Group A doesn't agree with group B. And so it gets to a point where they're so in such disagreement that it becomes violent in the sense that they now organize themselves in a military fashion to fight each other. Uh, that's pretty much what you're seeing in today's world. Um, that's been like that since all of human history. It doesn't have to have a flag. You don't have to have a banner. It's literally this group has organized themselves against this group and vice versa. One thing I underlined that jumped out to me when I was reading this was it is critical to keep in mind that the enemy is not an inanimate object to be acted upon, but an independent and animate force with its own objective and plans. I think all too often uh, as a war fighting institution across the board, um, we have a problem with either static or scripted ranges to the point where we assume that everything is going to go in such a way or we assume that the enemy is going to act in this way or the third in that way or the third way. But we forget that we're facing people um, and individuals who can think they can um, react to everything you're doing. They can apply pressure. They can. We I have yet to go onto a range where we are being actively suppressed. Uh, and how are we going to actually react to that? Granted, there's a whole lot of safety that goes into that, um, but we need to start stepping away from uh, doing these scripted cookie cutter ranges. Next one is the object in war is to impose our will on the enemy. At the end of the day, guys, it's literally just, I'm, I want to do this or I want that, and you're either gonna do it or we're gonna go to blows over it. And more times than not, you will go to blows over it. Now, with all this said and all this being introduced, there are multiple characteristics within war that make it what it is and make it so um, such a a broad stroke of a of a word, right? All these other smaller subtopics and characteristics that make up war is realistically what we need to break down in order to understand what exactly we're doing and how we can be better at it. Because after all, we, again, we are a war fighting institution. So the first one is friction. Now, friction is, uh, is one of my favorite ones um, simply because it makes everything very, very black and white. It makes everything very um, easy to digest simply because friction uh, is the force that makes the apparently easy so difficult, right? And so uh, the best way that I can explain friction is if you are trying to, if you are, this is your squad, that's you, okay? And you need to get to this area right here. We're just gonna we're just gonna put a circle. Okay, you need to go there. Now the problem with going there is now there is a river. Now there is a machine gun on the other side of the river. Now that all of a sudden there's anti-personnel mines in your path to even get to the river. All of a sudden now you are taking indirect fire. And now it's like, okay, well, what should have been super simple was us, us moving from point A to point B. Now I have to cross the river. I'm being shot at by machine guns. I'm running into anti-personnel mines and I'm getting hit with indirect fire. That now becomes so difficult the simple task of moving from point A to point B has now had so much friction applied that it feels like it is impossible to do that simple task. That's a very bare bones, minimum, minimalistic way to explain it, but that is, that's exactly what it is. All right, cool. Moving on. So now another thing that kind of, uh, uh, we'll say jumped out at me reading this 
was it can be mental, it can be physical, and it can also be self-induced, and we'll get that, we'll get to that next. But friction may be external, imposed by enemy action, the terrain, weather, or mere chance. Going back to my uh, description here, right? If we go, if we look, look at the picture here, you know, it could be from the enemy, it could be the terrain, chance that you're running into these mines. If it was raining, you know, weather. And continue on, it can also be self-induced, right? So self-induced friction is one of the easiest ones to uh, to control at your level, right? So self-induced frictions, think of the term or phrase going in the black, um, not having enough ammo, not having enough water, not having enough food, uh, not plotting your points correctly and taking the time to plot very, very, very pinpoint accurate checkpoints and getting the appropriate grids. Those can be self-induced uh, points of friction. Now, the thing about friction that is self-induced, if you have self-induced friction, that is a you problem. That is something that you can take care of at your level that you can mitigate. So of all the types of friction, right? Mental, physical, and self-induced, this one by far needs to be the one that you focus on the most. And the best place to mitigate self-induced friction is it during your PCCs and PCIs, during your planning, in the assembly area, uh, BAMSIS, right? Begin planning, arranging the recon, all that stuff prior to you actually executing your plan, that all can be mitigated and you won't have any self-induced friction if you do it prior to and take the time to actually prepare. Now, so not saying that there might not be some crazy, there's always one, right? Not, not saying there's some crazy out of the blue scenario that can happen, but if you take the time to actually prepare, then you should be good, okay? Now, moving on to uncertainty. And I know I'm moving fast, guys. I don't want this to be a lecture. I'm not a teacher or professor by any means. I'm just a dude who enjoys this kind of stuff. And honestly, if you think and you you think I'm wrong, by all means, please say something so we can talk about it, you know? Um, so uncertainty. Uncertainty pervades battle in the form of unknowns about the enemy, about the environment, and even about the friendly situation. Again, so I'm going to pull from friction about how some of planning Uncertainty. So we have so many ISR assets at our disposal, ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. We have so many tools, assets, and people that we can employ to answer a lot of the questions that we are uncertain about. If you are not as a, as a unit leader, a small unit leader, as an individual warfighter going out of your way to try and answer a lot of these questions, that is where you are failing yourself and the people around you. War is intrinsically unpredictable. Now, with all that being said, you can do all the reconnaissance, all the surveillance, gather all the intelligence in the world, and then last second things change and now you're walking to a completely different situation. So you need to be able to flex, you need to be able to work through the uncertainty and be able to recognize the situation for what it is and quickly come up with a game plan to approach the new situation effectively. Now, how do we do that? Well. One of the best ways to do it is keep it simple, stupid, uh, acronym KISS. So all the throughout my entire time being uh, a DOD employee, the best thing I can say is the most simplest plan is probably the best one because there's, there are less points of failure, right? If you have this crazy elaborate plan that requires so many different, you know, different things, not saying that every plan is going to be simple, but the more complicated you make it, the harder it's going to be to actually execute that plan as best to your, as best to your ability, because guess what? The enemy is a living, breathing, thinking uh, individual. He is not an inanimate, inanimate object, so he will be able to throw a wrench in your plan. That's why you want to keep it simple, so you can flex off of it very quickly. Uh, underline this: part of uncertainty is the ungovernable element of chance. Going back to what I just said, you could have the best plan in the world, and out of nowhere, Billy Bob Jr. from over the hills does some crazy stuff that you were not expecting, and your plan is completely like useless. So you need to be prepared for that. Moving on to fluidity. So no episode can be viewed in isolation. Why is that underlined? Well, because at the end of the day, whatever instance, scenario, moment, second, minute, hour will bleed over into the next uh, one of those listed uh, things, right? Because whatever you do now is going to affect what's going to happen next. That sounds like, oh yeah, I know that, of course. But a lot of people don't think about that, right? A lot of people don't think about the effect right? Cause and effect. They don't think about what is happening next, right? A lot of people see, a lot of people tend to forget that for every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction, right? I know we're talking, you know, laws and physics and stuff, but it's, it holds true and it holds its water when it comes to warfare as well, 
right? You're not just going to go in there and nothing is, nothing is going to happen outside of what you're doing. There's going to be all kinds of things going on that's happening because you could be assaulting, go back to this. You could be assault, you, sh you could be moving across this way, right? And say the, the task was you needed to destroy a machine gun bunker. All right. So again, we're come, we're trying to go over here and destroy this machine gun bunker. Now, what you don't know is that you destroying that machine gun bunker, somehow it affects, and you don't know the, you don't know to the full extent the effects, but it affects all the other enemy positions um, behind it, right? You don't know that until it happens, or you might know that based off your planning and, and, uh, and your reconnaissance, your surveillance and your intelligence gathering. So fluidity is one of those things where like, it's easy to say, oh yeah, I understand what fluid it is, fluidity is, but then when you know you ask someone to explain it to you, they, they'll do kind of what I'm doing. They're kind of like trying to explain it, but it's very difficult uh, because it somehow it twists to how everyone else sees it individually. Um, so that's just kind of on the person and how you see it. Uh, but there are undertones in which that you can't change. Success depends on the large part on the ability to adapt, right? So new scenario, excuse me. You are, let's say, okay, so let's say here's your squad again. And your squad is tasked to take a trench. We'll just get one of these T-shaped trenches that we all know and love. All right. Now, as you're coming up to the trench, the dude with the grenade, who's supposed to do the frag battle drill, boom, dead. He dies. Bye-bye. Now, the question is, did you brief and does everyone know the guy who was supposed to have the grenade? Is the, is the, the guy going with him, his buddy, is he confident and competent to finish the frag battle drill by taking it off the dead guy, off his dead buddy, and then finishing by throwing it in, right? So when it comes to success depends on a large part of the ability to adapt, you need to have plans, backup plans, backup plans to the backup plans, or, and this is where one of my, this is why I like to argue, you should just have simply a plan. A backup plan is a nice to have, not a need to have, but you should be able to, off of your plan alone, there should be so much flexibility within it that you don't have to make such dramatic changes. That's personally what I believe. That's how I've always done it. That's how I've done all my planning and it's worked for me great. I know other people who do it the same way. It's worked for them great. I could be wrong. Please, by all means, let me know if you feel differently. We can talk about it. All right, moving on to disorder. So disorder. In an environment of friction, uncertainty, and fluidity, war gravitates naturally toward disorder. One thing that popped out to me once I was reading this uh, topic was natural disorder, which creates the conditions ripe for ex exploitation by an opportunistic will. So when we say natural disorder, right, are we talking about natural as in nature or are we just natural as in it is inherently going to become disorderly through the, the characteristics of war? I think it can be both. I think if you want to argue both, you can easily. And so for natural disorder to occur, it you just have to exist, right? Nothing is ever going to happen the way we want. Nothing is ever going to be so easy that we're comfortable doing it. So simply digging into, uh, you know, digging into a defense and all of a sudden it's pouring rain and the enemy can't keep their, their fighting holes um, manned because they keep filling up with water and the, the dirt they're digging in has just become a sloshy mud and it's collapsing on itself. That would be a great time to exploit, not only because the rain's going to cover the sound of your movement, it's going to obscure their vision, but it's going to make it difficult for them to actually get inside their fighting holes and engage you from a covered position. It's going to essentially be an even playing field. And even then, they're going to be so disoriented on what's going on because they're so focused and fixed in a certain position, that it'll be easy for you to flank. And then I kind of came down here. The best we can hope for is to impose a general framework of order on the disorder to influence the general flow of action rather than to try and control each event. Again, going back to going back to fluidity, keep it simple, stupid. Have a plan so that when shit goes sideways, it doesn't matter how crazy it gets. Your plan is so flexible and it's so loose that it can still be adhered to while being able to be stay resilient by bending to, and, and bowing to the situations and then snapping back to when you need it to. All right, complexity. So complexity, 
In reality, each belligerent is not a single homogeneous will guided by a single intelligence. Instead, each belligerent is a complex system consisting of numerous individual parts. Now, for complexity, it's one of those things that's hard to explain without reading the entirety of this small, short um, explanation uh, or written word. Now, the best way that I can explain it, the best way that – and what I pull from this is that no matter how simple you try and make your plan, there is still going to be complex parts, right? When we do our five-paragraph order and we get to our fire support plan, you could arguably say that's complex, right? When you have to start clearing – airspace and deconflicting airspace in order to utilize all of your assets both air and ground that can be complex again you could have the simplest plan in the world but there are still smaller complexities that still have to be dealt with and you need to be you need to be prepared to do that right you need to be prepared to deal with how if you hop into one trench and that that enemy group uh, has a low morale and they surrender they drop their weapons you can't go in and blast them and then all of a sudden you go into the next trench and these dudes are hardened, hard-nosed. They want to kill you. You want to kill them. You have to be able to turn that switch on and off. Like that, that can be complex really quickly, right? So we're not going to spend too long on here. Um, you guys can read it for yourselves and then we can talk about it uh, however you want to do that. But then you have the human dimension. So the human dimension is central in war. Now, why do we think it's central in war? Well, in my opinion, I would say it's because humans. Humans are the ones fighting fighting the wars that we are talking about. So realistically, without if without humans, there is no human dimension. Um, and without humans, you can arguably say that war as we know it wouldn't exist. So what are we going to talk about when it comes to human dimension? Well, as we dig deeper into the human dimension, just understand that every single individual, every single group that makes up a bigger group that makes up a bigger group, at the end of the day, it's all made up of smaller groups and then down to the individual, which has ripple effects throughout the institution, the organization, the unit, whatever, what have you. And so when it comes down to executing, say, a mission, every single person is going to act in either subtle ways differently or big ways differently. And you'll see that, you know, once you start going into field ops where you're like seven days in, you've been you've been rained on the whole time, you'll start to see the human dimension pull, uh, kind of rear its head. War is an extreme trial of moral and physical strength and stamina. All right, so moral, physical strength, and stamina. So pretty much at the end of the day, I think, and I argue this, is that you could be the strongest guy you could be the fastest guy, but if you don't have enough mental fortitude, one, just to stay calm, cool, and collected, and two, to keep your wits about you when it comes down to making moral and ethical decisions, I think we need to work that before we even talk about physical physical strength and stamina. Because if you don't have the mental fortitude to do the, do the things that are physically challenging or do the things that are, uh, that are challenging your stamina, like it doesn't matter because you're unwilling to do it. Your will is weak and you won't do it. Violence and danger. Um, I actually just saw a post by um, Killzone, the Instagram page Killzone, uh, Major Schumann. I don't know if I said his last name right, but he posted um, on Instagram essentially a picture showing why people aren't joining the military. And one of them was they were scared to get hurt, essentially. That was like the number one reason. Now, I guess – Contrary to popular belief, life, well, you're going to get hurt in life. And someone could argue, well, why would I go to war to you know, increase that chance? Well, I can tell you right now, some of the safest places you could be on a military base, uh, some of the unsafest places you could be uh, could be things like a bank. You never know. It just might not be your lucky day. You know, crossing the street is dangerous. You know, you could go, go out by a heart attack. Life is dangerous, right? So... Um, just kind of to touch on that, I just wanted to say like that is it's, – it's difficult for me to kind of sympathize with some of the people who are worried about getting hurt because they don't want to join the military or as a reason why they don't want to join the military when honestly like I think the military, obviously I'm biased, is one of the greatest things that you could do in your life because you don't have to – you do not have to be in a combat arms MOS. You could be an enabler and supporting role, which is great too. All right, the, sorry, super crazy tangent. But anyways, violence and danger. So it should never be romanticized. And I see this a lot with the young guys um, and gals is, is people will see these Hollywood movies and they're like, dang, like that's so cool. I want to go in. I want to go. 
I want to go kill the bad guy, which is great, right? That's great to have that motivation, that drive, but don't romanticize it. Don't sit there and, and kind of create this false image of what it's going to be like when you go to combat, because it's not, it's not going to be how you pictured it. It's probably going to be worse and it's going to give you a serious gut check. It's going to check your soul. It's going to check your spirit, your mental. It's going to check your physical. Like I would be very prepared to look at war. And if you're going to participate in combat, be prepared for your whole world to get rocked. If you start to fall in love with it. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have that, that, that hard nose, hard charging, I'm going to kill the enemy mentality. What I'm saying is don't look at it as if you're watching a Hollywood movie. Leaders must study fear, understand it, and be prepared to cope with it. So one of the biggest things is uh, one of the discussions that I've had before with a lot of subordinate uh, in, um, members within my organization is, and senior members within my organization is, how do we lead um, the subordinate member? And, and honestly, a lot of people, and I think a lot of the older generation might say, well, you just got to yell at them, um, lead by fear, essentially, right? But the problem with leading by fear is that at some point, something is going to scare that subordinate member more than you, right? If I'm asking my subordinate members to take that hill, and on top of that hill, there's a machine gun nest. If that machine gun nest instills more fear in them than me barking orders to them, they are not going to do it. However, if I create a culture of respect, dignity, trust, love for each other, it's it, it love in the sense of a brotherly love. It's the sense of like, yes, I am fearful of that machine gun nest because I know the consequences of if I get tagged by it. But I respect my leader so much and I know that he's going to take care of me and I trust his decision making. That regardless of how scared I am, regardless of the fear that I feel settling in, I'm still going to push forward. And the fact that my leader is going forward and he's fighting instills more courage and confidence in me and starts to push that fear away. So that's that's my hot take on uh, on leaders must study fear and understand it, be prepared to cope with it. That's what I believe in. If you don't believe that way, I mean, again, we can always talk about it. Physical, moral, and mental forces. War is characterized by the interaction of physical, moral, and mental forces. All right, that's like kind of what's like, okay, no shit, right? So what does this mean though? Like how do we how do we break down physical, moral, and mental forces? Well, according to MCDP1, when it comes to physical stuff, it's not like physical as in the body. It's coming in like physical objective Cs, terrain, force ratios, loss of material or life. We're thinking we're looking at quantity, like numbers, right? We're looking at maps, things of that nature. When it comes to moral forces, moral forces are difficult to grasp and impossible to quantify. We cannot easily gauge forces like national and military resolve, national or individual conscious, emotion, fear, courage, morale, leadership, or a spirit. War also involves a significant mental or intellectual component. Mental forces provide the ability to grasp complex, complex battlefield situations to make effective estimates, calculations, and decisions, to devise tactics and strategies, and to develop plans. That is Obviously, they wrote it. It's published as a doctrinal pub. They wrote it to the best of their ability. I I wouldn't even change or speak on this at all because this is – there's nothing else to say. Like this explains it perfectly. All right, the evolution of war. All right, so this is a big one. So the reason why this is a big one to me and I believe is because we're seeing a speed and rate at which technology is being developed so fast that what is being developed today and what we are receiving today is going to be obsolete tomorrow. Quite literally, I just saw a post how we're mounting law rockets on robot dogs, and they're testing that right now on one of the military installations on the West Coast. That is crazy to me. Never did I – it's something out of a sci-fi movie. Now we have – we've all seen it. We have drones that you can buy off Amazon being rigged with grenades so that they can drop it on enemy positions. I would have never seen that coming growing up. And now it's happening. It, you 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 think you would have only read it in a Tom Clancy book? He's not. I'm not sponsoring Tom Clancy by any means. Small disclaimer. It's just part of the discussion. Uh, so it's kind of like one of those things where like you're seeing these crazy sci-fi ideas being implemented in real time in our current war wars that we're fighting today and we're seeing today, and we need to be prepared to counter it, right? So one of the things that I've seen before is if you've ever seen, I believe it was Tracer Tactical. That's their Instagram handle. Um, they found that if you take a regular umbrella and you hide behind the umbrella, you essentially will block the thermal imaging. Um, it, you can even camouflage it, spray paint it, add whatever you want to add to make it more um, uh, concealed. 
Um, plexiglass also works. Problem with plexiglass though, it's hard to pack. I don't want to lug around plexiglass all the time. And it's see, you can see through it at night or during the day, I'm sorry. Uh, another one is thermal blankets, right? Those emergency thermal blankets. Those also work very well. We've done that before. We did, an op we did a field op where um, the opposing force was trying to find us on thermals with some of the drones and we all got inside and underneath thermal blankets and they couldn't find us. Um, it was pretty, it was actually pretty cool to see. So you have to be able to adapt. You got to be able to think about how am I going to exploit the critical vulnerability of said you know, technology. And that takes looking into that technology. That takes actually going in and being like, all right, how, how does this work? How does it, how can I defeat it, et cetera, et cetera. That also means we have to be get, getting good at analog. Specific to the wars today, the more futuristic and, and electronic things go, there's a counter to it. So be able, be able to use a mapping compass. Don't rely on that GPS. The science, art, and dynamic of war. All right, so what's cool about the science, art, and dynamic of war is that you you need to look at the basics, knowing things like max effective ranges, um, doctrinal tactics, um, numbers and quantities, uh, definitions and acronyms. Like that's the science, right? That's the hardcore foundation of everything. Now you slap on the art. What is the art? The art is how you apply those things. That is that is how you apply those doctrinal tactics. How do you bend those doctrinal tactics to exploit a situation better than how the doctrinal tactic explained, right? How do you make it look sexy? How do you make it look and feel and execute better or even more smoothly when the plan is kind of complex? You know, it's, it's how you apply the science and the dynamic of war. So as we have said, war is a social phenomenon and it its essential dynamic is the dynamic of competitive human interaction rather than the dynamic of art or science. Human beings interact with each other in ways that are fundamentally different from the way a scientist works with chemicals or formulas or the way an artist works with paints or musical notes. It is because of this dynamic of human interaction and that fortitude, perseverance, boldness, spirit, and other traits not explainable by art or science are so essential in war. This is all in, 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 in uh, italics. We thus conclude that the conduct of war is fundamental, fundamentally a dynamic process of human competition requiring both the knowledge of science and the creativity of art, but driven ultimately by the power of human will. If that doesn't sum it up, I don't know what else does. All right, conclusion. I'm not going to read the whole conclusion piece, um, but I'm going to leave the conclusion up to you, the viewer, the reader, um, the warfighter. At the end of the day, like... It's up to you to read this. It's up to you to digest it. I can sit up here and talk all day. Honestly, you know, you could have felt like you wasted 30 minutes of your time listening to some dude um, talk over a, a, a military publication. That's fine. But if you are in a warfighting institution, right, I'm going to ask you this one time and one time only. Regardless of your occupation, regardless of your MOS, regardless of your belief system, are you doing this for the paycheck or are you doing this because you actually care? Are you doing this because you have to? because someone told you to, or are you doing this because you want to make sure that the guy to your left and right makes it home healthy, safe, and alive, and not in a six-foot pine box?